From what I was told by my father, the Bath was more or less divided into two major societies, North Enders and South Enders. Anyone below uh, uh, Center Street was a South Ender, and anyone above Center Street was a North Ender. Well, when we came up here to school, the North End kids called us the stinking South Enders. It was as though you had a line right down the middle of South Street. Anything south was the stinking South Enders. It was when we got a little older that they mingled. There, there was the upper crust up there. <laughs> they were always nice people, but they always, I thought, they thought they're a little better than, you know, if you work for them, you're a maid. You're not a maid anymore. You know, they don't call you maids anymore. People must have had a lot of money that they had saved for memorialization. I mean, now, that looks like a dead tree. And then look at the mausoleum next to it. It represented what they thought of themselves, I think. They were big men. They probably made a lot of money. They certainly lived big houses, had fresh haddock instead of salt cod. And Bath was a community which was uh, a truly a mixed community from the very wealthy to the very poor. It was then, as it is today, essentially a blue collar community. Uh, although uh, uh, there were a number of very prominent families uh, residing in Bath who possessed uh, fortunes uh, uh, which to the common man sort of boggled their imaginations. I think it was a rather friendly town, even though North Enders didn't like the South Enders. <laughs> I think they really, they didn't hate them. But uh, I've always had the feeling that, that there was a good community spirit in Bath. I think there is even today. Most houses in town did not have electricity. Electricity had come to town some before that, but the average person uh, was still using oil lamps. It wasn't until about 1916 the average shipyard worker, for example, could afford to have electricity. The price came down and the wages went up, so they uh, seemed reasonable. And I believe the same was probably true in plumbing. Most houses may have had a running cold water spigot uh, in the sink uh, downstairs, and that's about all. They really are products of 18th century parents, but they lived to see the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. They went from uh, mutton tallow candles to steam power and electricity, all the kinds of things that are just matter of fact to us. When these people, my grandfather's father uh, and his brother were young, young men, it was still an 18th century world. It was an 18th century Maine. My grandfather came to town and did the plumbing perhaps from the water line into the house and plumbed the house, but the major laying of the water mains would have been done, uh, supervised by some company that uh, specialized in that sort of thing, and most of it was done by hand, and uh, they imported Italian laborers to do a lot of it, and I believe several of them were killed uh, by dynamite or whatever, uh, doing this job in Bath. This is a sign my daughter brought from Bangor for me. She belongs to the Italian Heritage Club. She wants me to leave it there. I think I will. We need a sign like this here. These are millstones that came from the mill that used to be down on the waterfront, down on Washington Street. These stones were used to grind feldspar. The feldspar was transported from Thompson and Pittsburgh, and they used to be the Italians getting the feldspar at the mines. These are worn wheels. They are originally 10 to 12 feet in diameter. And these are worn down to this size and cast away. I hope that you like the looks of them. Now, isn't, that, isn't that something? Doesn't that look like a plaque? See the bolts? That's not, that's not a plaque. That's what was left. They cut that all out. 
That at one time was way out to here. They cut this all off and left that scroll in there. And then somebody by hand polished those letters. Everything was done by hand. Everything. The, the different round raised letters and square raised letters and all of these were all done by hand. All this intricate thing was all done by hand and a mallet. I've got a mallet that shows you probably over millions of times that it's been tapped. You have to be very, very careful with this, but you don't need any equipment to do this, this work. You, you, don't, you don't need any equipment at all. All you need is just uh, a pair of eyes. And... Now, this is all my grandfather. This is his only tool that he had, and that's probably been hit hundreds of thousands of times. And this is I was saying that you know how close I work to this thing here. But if you get it on this side here, you come down and, oh, oh you know, you hit that knuckle. And uh, you only hit it once or twice a day. Back in my grandfather's day was bull luck and ignorance. They were masters at rolling stones. They'd roll these stones to the lot. My grandfather, you see, he was a blacksmith, and uh, he worked down to my Uncle Mel Marco's welding place, and then he went from there to the uh, Bath Iron Works and was in the blacksmith shop up there. He was the one that started the fish business, but I think it was with a wheelbarrow in the house in the neighborhood, uh, going house to house in the neighborhood. But that was before my time. We had a large mill business. We sold it a good many house to house. Summer times we were up at 4.30. Winter time it was 5 because that milk had to be delivered and blankets covering it and give it before the sun got too high in the summertime. It was a great life on the farm. It was a hard life. We're on the banks of the uh, Winnegance Creek called originally the Winnegany River. Down there is a little boathouse that my grandfather used to use to go fishing with for bass in the winter on Winnegans Creek. And we're looking out onto the Kennebec River and Doubling Point Lighthouse. And uh, the piles of rocks you see on the mud flats are remnants of the long dam where there were 10 sawmills located. I think the people uh, in Winnegans were, uh, I guess you'd say mostly blue collar type people. Uh, they were farmers or laborers or brick masons or carpenters uh, or worked in the mills. I think that they were proud of what they did, and, uh, but it was a, certainly a blue collar area and I think that years ago the people in Bath sort of looked down on the area and uh, they used to call it, uh, because of the many sawmills, uh, slab town or sawdust patch. Old Bath was the center. My mother did all the shopping, and uh, she came with a horse and wagon, of course. And it was wonderful to ride in the Bath, you know, because there was nothing in West Bath. My name is Stella Doughty, and I grew up in West Bath on a farm that was owned by my father. He could sell a load of wood or even a load of hay. We raised more hay than we needed. He'd uh, put on a load of hay and take it in, in the bath and put it on the scales. And it wouldn't be any time before someone would come along and buy that load of hay. And then, you know, whatever he needed it for, to have the horse shod or whatever, that gave him the money for that. 
we had enough to get by on, but not to uh, sell much to make any big living. It, it was country. It was really country. You had your open hay fields, naturally, and then you had uh, your wooded areas, your pasture land, which was rough. All the high ground you see around here now was uh, uh, a few trees, uh, ledges, and it was rough country. Right out, right out in the country. As, as far as the relationship between the, uh, the outside towns and Bath, besides coming by horse and buggy, uh, many people came to Bath by, by water. I know there were people in, in West Point who uh, used to take a boat to New Meadows and then go into Bath from New Meadows on the trolley. That made a long day, too, if you wanted to go to town. <laughs> Bath did, in fact, in, on Front Street, uh, did have, at that time, an electric street railway, which had just really come into operation three or four years earlier. Uh, it was still more of a toy than a reality. Uh, it was a source of great uh, disparagement in the public press. Uh, uh, the cars themselves uh, were either too underpowered or uh, uh, too open in the dead of winter to uh, attract too many people. Uh, it was important to the community in the sense that it, first of all, it tied the two ends of the town together. Steamboats were still coming to Bath to um, carry people to Boston or up to Augusta or down to Booth Bay or over to Bangor. And that's right, the bridge in Bath was not built until 1928 and uh, there was a ferry for, that had already been running for many years from Bath to Woolwich. Well, I'm sure most of the steel used by the Bath Ironworks and lots of the masts and so forth used by the shipyards uh, came by rail. But of course, they were also shipping a lot of things by um, sailing vessel. Um, and most of the wood which came from Georgia uh, for building the ships uh, came by schooner. Many of these workmen who, who worked here were in fact from Canada from the maritime provinces, particularly New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia. Uh, they came to Bath to uh, find work when the shipyards in their area closed down. Now these people frequently would move from job to job. They were not, they were not employed by Percy and Spall. They were not employed by Arthur Sewell and Company. They would take a job there uh, while there was construction going on and when that shipyard completed a particular vessel they would move on trying to find another one hopefully in town uh, or maybe going down to Phippsburg. My father went to, went to work at the age of 13 in Kelly's Fair Shipyard. Well I guess the first two or three years that he was there as a, as a 13 or 14 year old boy he was sort of a gopher, a water boy, or that sort of thing, worked around the stables. But when he was 16, which should have been uh, 1900, he was driving a team for uh, Kelly and Spear Shipyard. Had his own horses to take care of. <laughs> 10 cents an hour at the beginning, and then I think he made 15 cents an hour around that time. They did reasonably well by it. A uh, shipyard worker who might make, uh, on average, two, three dollars a day uh, in 1897, which would be, oh, uh, 50 or 60 dollars a day today, would put in a 10-hour day, six-day week in the wintertime, five-and-a-half-day week in the summertime. Uh, but they would own their own house. They were, this was not uncommon. Uh, to have their own house, maybe not large, maybe not luxurious, maybe not one of the revival style on Washington Street, but they owned their own house. 